If you want to pass GED social studies so you can move ahead to bigger and better things in life, like college or a better job, know that that's what I made this video to help you do, and we're getting started right now. The two major political parties in the United States are the Democrats and Republicans. Both parties have different viewpoints on the role of government in the U.S. Voters who do not identify as Republican or Democrat are known as independents. Before a general election takes place, candidates within each party must compete against each other to win their party's nomination. The winner of the Democratic primary competes against the winner of the Republican primary in the general election. Third-party candidates represent smaller political parties. While third-party candidates cannot typically gain enough votes to win a general election, these candidates can steal votes away from the other parties. The candidate who wins the general election will serve a four-year term as President of the United States. The term limit is two years total. Question. Which of the following is false? A. A primary election takes place before a general election. B. A U.S. President can only serve for four years. C. A third-party candidate is not usually expected to win a general election but can steal votes away from the other parties. Or D. Voters who do not identify as Republican or Democrat are known as independents. So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, take all the time you need with this question, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the correct answer here is B. A U.S. president can only serve for four years. So why is this false? Well, it tells us that the person who wins the general election will serve a four-year term. However, the limit is two terms total. So a U.S. president can only serve for four years is not correct because the president, if they run again, and if that person wins a second election, they can serve another four-year term. So your next question says, which of the following is an example of a general election? A. A Republican running against a Republican for the U.S. presidency. B. A Democrat running against a Democrat for the U.S. presidency. C. A Republican running against a Democrat for the U.S. presidency. Or D. None of the above. So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's talk about this here. So you've, we have two different elections. There's the primary, and then there's the general election. Okay, so in the primary election, it's going to be Democrat versus Democrat, all right? And also Republican versus Republican. And then once we get to the general election, in the general election, all right, out of all the Democrats in the primary, the winner moves on to the general election, all right? And they're gonna take on whichever Republican candidate wins the primary. So the general election is Democrat versus Republican. The primary elections are gonna be Democrats versus Democrats and also Republicans versus other Republicans. So the answer here is C, in the general election, it's gonna be a Republican running against the Democrat for the US presidency. Each state is worth a specific number of electoral votes. The candidate who receives the highest number of electoral votes wins the election. The popular vote is the total number of votes a candidate receives. Two candidates are running against each other in a general election for the U.S. presidency. Most states are still counting votes, but the results for Pennsylvania, Alabama, Florida, Vermont, and California are in. The results so far show that candidate A won Pennsylvania, Alabama, and Florida, and candidate B won Vermont and California. Which candidate is winning at this point in the vote count? Is it candidate A? Is it candidate B? Are the results tied? Or do we need to know the total number of votes each candidate has received to answer this question? Now down here we have a table that shows how many electoral votes each state is worth. Pennsylvania is worth 20, Alabama is worth 9, Vermont is worth three, California is worth 55, and Florida is worth 29. So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, and I should have told you this before I let you try this, but calculators are a fair game for this entire test here. Uh, so for any question on my practice test here, you, you're free to use your calculator for but what we're going to do here is candidate A, we have to look at how many electoral votes candidate A has right now. 
So candidate A won Pennsylvania, which gives 20 votes. Candidate A also won Alabama, so we're going to also add 9 here. Candidate A also won Florida, and Florida is worth 29 electoral votes. So we're going to do 20 plus 9 plus 29, whether you did that with a calculator, whether you did it in your head, whether you wrote it out by hand. All right, this is going to come out to 58. So candidate A has 58 electoral votes. Now what about candidate B? Well, candidate B won Vermont and California. Vermont is worth three electoral votes, and California is worth uh, 55 electoral votes. So let's add this up, and we'll see that candidate B so far has 58 electoral votes. So at this stage in the election, they are neck and neck. They are tied up here. And the answer is C, the results are tied. Okay, so for this next question, I typed the question out and I realized that if you're on a small screen device like an iPhone, smartphone, or a tablet, it might be hard to see. So I rewrote some of the numbers out here. And so let me just break this down. So this over here says, this is a distribution of expenditures of candidate A's US presidential campaign in million US dollars unclassifiable 5%, all other 7.8%, fundraising 6.6%, which I wrote out here for you, administrative 11%, and this little number right here, this 11%, all I did was rewrote this right here, okay, and I did the same with the 6.6%, and I just did this so that you can see it a little bit easier, that's all. Salaries, 25.8%, and again, this little number right here is just 25.8%, and all I did was rewrite it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see, hopefully. Media, 43.8%. All right, so now we come over here to distribution of expenditures of candidate B's U.S. presidential campaign in million U.S. dollars. Unclassifiable, 9%. All other, 1.1%. Fundraising, 0.6%, which I rewrote right here a little bit bigger. And then administrative is 5.1%, and I'm, I'm just writing this out again just so it's easier to see. Salaries, 39.4%, and media, 44.8%. All right, so the numbers that you'll need to answer the question, I rewrote them all out so it's a little bit easier to see. The unclassifiable and all other numbers, you don't need to, to look at those to get the question right, all right? So this says here, which of the following statements is supported by the pie charts? A, salaries were a larger source of expenditure for candidate A than for candidate B. B, candidate A spent significantly more money on media than candidate B. C, administrative expenses were a larger source of expenditure for candidate A than candidate B. Or D, fundraising was the largest source of expenditure for both candidate A and candidate B. So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's break these down. A, salaries were a larger source of expenditure for candidate A than for candidate B. Well, if we look over here for candidate A, we see salaries that was 25.8% versus for candidate B, 39.4%. So that's not supported by the pie chart. B says candidate A spent significantly more money on media than candidate B. Well, if we go over here to candidate A for the media category, candidate A spent 43.8%, whereas candidate B spent 44.8%. So we see that B spent a little bit more money. So B, candidate B spent a little bit more money, so answer B we know can't be right. C, administrative expenses were a larger source of expenditure for both candidate A than, for candidate A than candidate B. So if we look at the administrative category, we see candidate A logged 11% versus candidate B, who logged 5.1%. So C is the correct answer here. So this video's champion shoutout goes to a successful GED test taker who just passed and said, five years later, I decided to make a step to better my future, and with a bit of help, I did it. So I always like to share these stories to hopefully inspire or motivate anyone out there who's struggling. And just know that if you are struggling and going through challenges right now, we're all in this together. And that if you just keep persevering, someday you'll have the GED behind you and you'll be able to move ahead. The Louisiana Purchase Treaty, April 30th, 1803. 
And whereas in pursuance of the treaty, and particularly of the third article of the French Republic, has an incontestable title to the domain and to the possession of the said territory, the first consul of the French Republic, desiring to give the United States a strong proof of his friendship, doth hereby cede to the United States in the name of the French Republic forever and in full sovereignty the said territory with all its rights and appurtenances, appurtenances, I think, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, as fully and in the same manner as they have been acquired by the French Republic in virtue of the above-mentioned treaty concluded by His Majesty. In the session made by the preceding article are included the adjacent islands belonging to Louisiana, all public lots and squares, vacant lands, and all public buildings, fortifications, barracks, and other edifices which are not private property. The archives, paper, and documents relative to the domain and sovereignty of Louisiana and its dependencies will be left in the possession of the commissaries of the United States, and copies will be afterwards given in due form to the magistrates and municipal officers of such of the paid paper, said papers and documents as may be necessary to them. The inhabitants of the ceded territory shall be incorporated in the, United, in the Union of the United States and admit it as soon as possible, according to the principles of the federal constitution, to the enjoyment of all these rights, advantages, and immunities of citizens of the United States, and in the meantime they shall be maintained and protected in the free enjoyment of their liberty, property, and the religion which they profess. Which the following is true based on the passage above. A. The French Republic purchased territory for the United States. B. The purchasing nation received all land in Louisiana, including private property. C. The inhabitants of the territory gained the rights of U.S. citizens. Or D. None of the above. And as always, I don't expect that you're going to be able to take all this in just by hearing me read it. Um, so I'm expecting that you'll pause the video and take all the time you need, maybe reread this, or at least reread parts of it that you think are relevant. And whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so in this case here, what's happening, right, it kind of tells us in the opening here is that uh, the United States is buying the territory from the French Republic. So the French Republic didn't purchase the territory from the U.S. It's actually the other way around. And it also tells us, so as we go down here, it says the purchasing nation received all land in Louisiana, including private property. Well, right here, it, this part of the passage, it talks about uh, the, the land that's purchased in Louisiana. And it says that the United States is going to acquire all public lots, squares, vacant lands, public buildings, fortifications, barracks, and other edifices which are not private property. So that tells us that the United States is going to get all the land in Louisiana, but they're not going to get the private property. All right, so B is out. Now C, the inhabitants of the territory gain the rights of U.S. citizens. Well, to see if this is true or false, we need to look at this little snippet right here, okay, where it basically tells us that the inhabitants of those territories are going to be incorporated in the Union of the United States, and it goes on to say that they're going to get the advantages and immunities of citizens of the United States. Jonestown County Family Finances, and we see years 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2003. We see the median income for a family of four listed going down for each year. We see the average percent to taxes. We see 35, 34, 32, and 32. And we see average percent to savings. We see 6.3, 5.9, 5.8, and 6.0. So the question is, what is the average percent to savings from 2000 to 2003? For this one, we don't have multiple choice answers. This is for you to come up with your own answer. And I don't care how you round it. I just care about the process. Do you know how to calculate the average? And if you don't, that's okay, because that's what we're about to learn. So let me turn it over to you. You can pause the video, take all the time that you need with this. You can use a calculator if you'd like to. And when you're ready, just unpause the video and we'll talk about it. Okay, so knowing how to get the average is really, really important. It's one of the most important skills for the GED test. Another way to say the average is the mean. And finding the mean or finding the average, those are two different ways of saying the same thing. But this is really, really important because mean, median, mode, and range questions can show up on science. They can show up on social studies. 
and they can of course show up on math. So it's really important to make sure that we go over that a lot, not just for social studies, but for a lot of the, really for all the sections except for the RLA section, it's important. So to find the average, all we do is we want to take all of the numbers in our data set and we're gonna add them up and we're gonna divide by the number of numbers in that data set. And I know that might sound confusing, but let me show you what I'm doing here. All right, so I'm just taking each value under the average percent to savings column. So 6.3, I plug it in up here, then I add to it 5.9, and I add to that 5.8, and I also wanna to add to that six. Okay, so again, to find the average, I wanna add up all of the numbers in the data set, and I want to count up how many numbers there are. So we have one, two, three, four different numbers here. So that's why I'm dividing by four. Okay. So if you did this step, I don't really care how you rounded. All right. You might get something like 6.075 is I think what my calculator gave me. All right. You can round that to six if you want to. You can round that to 6.1. Like I said, I don't care how you rounded it. Just if you did this process right, if you took all of these numbers and added them up and divided by four, all right, and you got something close to this number, depending on how you rounded, then consider the, that consider that you got the right answer because this process is really what I want you to take away from this question here. All right, so if you didn't know how to do this, then don't worry about it. It's just practice right now. We don't care about, I don't really care if you get every question in this practice test wrong, as long as, long as you're learning something from it. What is the mode of the data set average percent to taxes? So now would be a good time to pause the video, try to find the mode of the data set average percent to taxes, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so we just talked about how to find the average. You do that by adding up all of the numbers in the data set and then counting them up and saying, hey, there's one, two, three, four, and you divide them by four. Now, to find the mode, you wanna look for the most occurring number in the data set. So in this case, average percent of taxes, this is our data set right here. We've got 35, 34, 32, and 32. And we see that 32 shows up twice. So in this data set here, out of these four numbers, we see that 32 is the most occurring number because it shows up twice and both 35 and 34 only show up once. So the answer here is simply 32. Okay, hopefully none of these questions get too awkward today. Dogs or cats? Well, growing up, I always considered myself a dog person. And then when my wife and I lived in Philadelphia, we had mice in our apartment and we went out and got Tommy and I jumped ship and I'm now a cat person. So I'm going with cats. Who's sleep or skip a meal? Ooh, that's a hard question. Well, my wife and I had a baby recently, so I lose plenty of sleep as it is already. Football game or basketball game? To watch, I'm gonna say football. The Vietnam War was fought between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. China and the Soviet Union supported North Vietnam, while the United States supported South Vietnam. American troops did not enter the war until 1965, when 3,500 U.S. Marines landed in South Vietnam. Initially, the general public overwhelmingly supported U.S. involvement. As the war continued, the following events occurred. Troop desertion rates quadrupled from what they were in 1996. By 1974, the Reserve Officers Training Corps, or ROTC, enrollment declined to the lowest point in history. Also, just 2.5% of troops elected infantry combat positions. Which of the following is the best inference based on the passage above? A. Troop morale dropped the longer the war lasted. B. The U.S. Navy played a major role during the Vietnam War. C. Today, Vietnam has the 36th largest economy in the world. Or D. American forces were sent to South Vietnam to help the nation defend itself rather than to conquer North Vietnam. So now would be a good time to pause the video, take all the time you need with this question, reread as you see fit, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so a couple things to note here about inferences. So an inference is an educated guess, and to 
get an inference question right, you have to really look at the evidence and the facts that are presented in the passage, and you also just have to use your own intuition based off of your own experience, and you just kind of have to take a leap of faith sometimes with these questions here. So let's look at some of the incorrect answers now. So B says the U.S. Navy played a major role during the Vietnam War. Now, this might be a true statement here, all right? I am not an expert on the Vietnam War by any means, but I do know that the country is largely surrounded by water, so I do know that the Navy played a very important role in the Vietnam War, but we're not looking for which statements are true here. So B may in fact be a true statement, but because the passage up here didn't say anything about the involvement of the Navy in Vietnam, we would not pick this as the best educated guess, all right? So B is not the best inference that we could make. All right, so similarly C, today Vietnam has the 36th largest economy in the world. So just like B, C may in fact be a true statement, but this is not something that you would infer based off of the information in the passage above. Because the passage does not talk about modern day Vietnam, it does not talk about Vietnam's economy or the size of it. So C and B both, again, might be true statements, but these are not the best inferences that you would make. So what about D? American forces were sent to South Vietnam to help the nation defend itself rather than to conquer North Vietnam. Well, D here too, all right? Again, I'm not an expert on the Vietnam War, but I do, and if you know more about this than I do, please, by all means, you know, chime in down below, all right? But D, American forces were sent to South Vietnam to help the nation defend itself rather than to conquer North Vietnam. This, again, may be a true statement here, but this is also not the best inference that you would make. All right, so this whole passage right here is really, it's talking about here, you know, troop desertion rates going way up. It's talking about enrollment in the reserve officers training corps going down. It's also talking about troops choosing less and less at a very low percentage of the troops choosing to serve in infantry combat positions. So these are all things that uh, would lead us to pick A as the best educated guest based on the passage above. So I know that I have subscribers who watch my videos who are planning to go and serve in the military once they complete the GED. So I just want to say, since we're kind of talking about the military here, that you know I really appreciate your service. Thank you for serving your country. For those who either have served or are planning to serve once you get the GED done, just want to say thank you for your service to our country. And we'll go on to the next question. In 1788, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay wrote the Federalist Papers, which is a collection of 85 articles and essays prompting ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Place a dot on the timeline above on the year of the publication of the Federalist Papers. We see the timeline below. So obviously you can't really place a dot on the timeline through the screen, but I'd just like you to pause the video and pick out where the dot should go. Okay, hopefully I had a chance to try this. So this took place in 1788. So we need to put the dot between 1785 and 1790. All right, so I'm going to say somewhere around here is where the dot would be. And uh, yeah, let's say right about there. So as long as you saw that the dot should go somewhere about here, all right, consider it that you got the right answer. The U.S. Constitution was signed on September 17, 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Federalists did not want a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution. On the other hand, the Anti-Federalists wanted a Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson was an Anti-Federalist and Alexander Hamilton was a Federalist. So here's the quote. I go further and affirm that Bills of Rights, in the sense that, in, and in the extent in which they are contended for, are not only unnecessary in the proposed Constitution, but would even be dangerous. Who most likely said the above quote? Was it A, Thomas Jefferson, or B, Alexander Hamilton? So let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need, reread as you need to, and whenever you're ready, simply unpause the video and we'll talk about this. Okay, so let's just kind of clarify the sides here. So we have the Federalists right here. And the Federalists, which I'm just going to write Fed here, Okay, they did not want a Bill of Rights. Okay, so the Federalists, they said no Bill of Rights. So I'm just going to say B-O-R. The Federalists wanted no Bill of Rights. Okay, and then we have the Anti-Federalists. And I'm not going to write out the whole thing for the sake of time. I'm just going to put Anti right here for the Anti-Federalists. 
and the Anti-Federalists wanted a Bill of Rights. Okay. Now, we've got Thomas Jefferson, who was an Anti-Federalist. So let me put TJ right here for Thomas Jefferson. And we have Alexander Hamilton. We've got A.H., who was a Federalist. All right, so we've got A.H. under the Federalist camp. All right, so we've I have to first just clarify the information. And let's look at the quote. It says, I go further and affirm that bills of rights, in the sense in any extent in which they are contended for, are not only unnecessary in the proposed Constitution, but would be dangerous. So, does the person who said the quote, do they want a Bill of Rights, or do they not want a Bill of Rights? Well, since they're saying a Bills of Rights are unnecessary and even dangerous, sounds like the person does not want there to be a Bill of Rights. Now, we know that Alexander Hamilton is a Federalist, and therefore did not want a Bill of Rights. So therefore, we would conclude that it's B, Alexander Hamilton, who said this quote. So the instructions say, batch the description of each amendment to the correct quote from the Bill of Rights. So let me read these all to you, and I'll explain again what I want you to do for this question. Amendment 4, protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Amendment 6, the right to a speedy and public trial. Amendment 7, protects the right to trial by jury in civil cases. Amendment 8, protects against excessive bail and fines. So now we have our quotes down here. Blank, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. Blank, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Blank, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. Blank. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue. All right, so again, up here we've got uh, four amendments in descriptions of what the amendment stands for. All right, and down here we've got four quotes from the Bill of Rights. So I want you to read the description of each amendment here and read the quotes. And so if you read this quote right here, for example, and you think, hey, that sounds like Amendment 4, you put a 4 in here. If you read this quote here and you think, hey, that sounds like Amendment 6, you'd put a 6 in here. All right? And that's just an example. I'm not saying these are the, are the right answers. I'm just showing you what I want you to do. And again, obviously, you're not going to be able to write on the computer screen or write through the screen. So just think about... But just think about how you would do it if you could. All right, so let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the first quote is, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. So if the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, that sounds like Amendment 7, because Amendment 7 says, protects the right to the trial by jury in civil cases. So Seven is going to be the right amendment description that matches this quote. Next, it says, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Well, up here, let's see, we've got a description that has to do with bails right here. Protects against excessive bails and fines. So this sounds like Amendment 8. All right, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. It's right out of amendment, the description of Amendment 6 right here clearly matches this. And that leaves us with four last year. All right, so the answer should be 7, 8, 6, and 4. Hopefully this all makes sense. Friends and citizens, the period for a new election of a citizen to administer the executive government of the United States being not far distant, and the time actually arrived when your thoughts must be employed and designated the person who is to be clothed with that important trust, it appears to me proper, especially as it may conduce to a more distinct expression of the public service, that I should now apprise you of the resolution I have formed to decline being considered among the number of those out of whom a choice is to be made. I beg you at the same time to do me the justice to be assured that this resolution has not been taken without a strict regard to all the considerations appertaining, I think is how you say that, to the relation which binds a dutiful citizen 
to his country, and that in withdrawing the tender of service which silence in my situation might imply, I am influenced by no diminution, I think that's how you say that, of zeal for your future interest, no deficiency of grateful respect for your past kindness, but am supported by a full conviction that the step is compatible with both. And looking forward to the moment which is intended to terminate the career of my public life, my feelings do not permit me to suspend the deep acknowledgement of that debt of gratitude which I owe to my beloved country for the many honors it has conferred upon me. The question is, what is the best inference for the title of this passage? A. The Mayflower Compact. B. Lincoln's First Inaugural Address. D. The Monroe Doctrine. Or E. Washington's Farewell Address. So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, try to figure this out, reread as you need to, and take all the time you need. I don't care if you get this right or wrong, this is all about the practice. So whenever you're ready, just pause and unpause the video and we'll go over the answer. Okay, so this is kind of a hard, harder question I would say to get, and basically, the there are clues throughout as to what's happening. I think, though, the most direct clue is right here where it says, in looking forward to the moment which is intended to terminate the career of my public life. So we're talking about, you know, the termination of someone's career in public life. All right. And so you would have to see here that, hey, Washington's farewell address. All right. So a farewell address means you're saying goodbye. That seems to make sense. It seems to make sense here that if, you know, someone's talking about terminating their career in public life, well, then they're probably giving a goodbye or a farewell address. So E is the correct answer here. So if you figure this out, and, and like I said, this is not the only clue. There's clues throughout also here that uh, can help you figure out what's happening, but I think this is the most direct statement here. So if you got this right, really, really great job. This is a harder question. And if you if you didn't get it right, uh, just give yourself a round of applause anyway for trying your best. So either way, give yourself an imaginary or a real round of applause for making it this far into the video. You're doing a really great job. So the next question shows Colorado population growth rate by year. Growth rate percent is over here on the vertical axis, and we've got years going from 2016 to 2022 right here. And it says, which of the following answer choices best describes the trend seen from 2018 to 2020? Is it A, increase, B, decrease, or C, no change? So let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so in a question like this, we only have to look at what's happening between 2018 to 2020. So basically, we only have to look at what's happening in between these bars right here. All right, so we don't care about what's happening right here or right here. We just care about between 2018 to 2020. Now, if we go to the leftmost part of the line, all right, where the line starts here at the leftmost part, and... We imagine we've got a little stick figure person, and if the stick figure person just follows the line, we see that the, the person would be going down a hill. All right, so that means that there is a decrease here. Okay, now let me explain to you if instead the line looked like this, and we imagine we had a little stick figure person starting here at the leftmost part of the line, and if the person starts at the leftmost part of the line and followed the line, and if the person's going uphill, that would be an increase. Okay. Now, on the other hand, the third scenario here is if we've got a case like this, where the line is flat. And if the line's flat, and if a person walking the line would be not going up or down, but just walking kind of straight like this, we would say that there is no change. All right. So just a couple little tricks to help you think through these questions. So the next question says, which of the following answer choices best describes the overall trend seen from 2016 to 2018? Is there an increase, a decrease, no change, or not enough information to answer? Let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. So for this case, again, we, we only care about what's happening from 2016 to 2018. All right, so essentially from the start of the, the graph here at 2016 to 2018. So all this information over here is not going to have anything to do with answering this question. If our stick figure starts at the leftmost portion here and follows the line, we see that they'll be going down the hill, but then they're changing direction and they're going back up the hill. Okay, 
So overall, if we draw a line from where the person starts to where the person ends right here, this line right here is what we want to pay attention to to answer a question about an overall trend. Okay. And in this case here, from here to where the person ends, we see that the stick figure, if they follow that path, they'll be going down. So there is an overall decrease. All right. Now, rather than thinking of it like a stick figure person, you could also just kind of look at the graph and see, okay, so the growth rate in 2016 was somewhere above 1.5. All right. And then once we got over here till 2018, 2018, all right, the growth rate was a little bit below 1.5, so that shows a an overall decrease. You could do it that way too. I'm just trying to present multiple ways to think about it. So I've picked the following question as this video's champion's challenge question. And if you're new to my channel, first of all, welcome. I really appreciate you being here. The champion's challenge question is, in my opinion, the hardest question in the video. So I'll let you try that down. The table above shows the percent registered to vote for selected states. What is the median percent registered to vote for the states included in the table? So in other words, look at the numbers here in the table and what is the median of those numbers? So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the mean means the average, the mode is the most occurring number in the data set, and the median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. All right, so the crucial first step here is to take these values and order them from smallest to largest. Okay, and so I've shown, shown that right here. I've typed the numbers out. So you would just go through all the numbers in this list and you'd have to just list them smallest to largest to start out. Okay, so this is probably the most common mistake I see in median questions is students, they, they remember that the word median sounds like middle, so they think, well, I have to pick the middle number. But what they oftentimes forget is to put the numbers in order from smallest to largest. So make sure that you do this. And then once you do that, you'll see here that there's not really a middle number here, okay? Because we, have in this case, have one, two, three, four, five, six numbers. So when you've got an even number of numbers, you have to take the two values in the middle here, and you have to add them up and divide by two. Okay, so again, if you've got an odd number of numbers, the middle number usually is going to just jump out at you. But if you look at the numbers here and you're kind of like, well, the middle looks like it would be right here. And there isn't just one middle number that jumps out at you. You've got to take the two numbers that are in the middle and add them up and divide by two. Okay. In other words, if you've got an even number of numbers, you have to take the two numbers in the middle, add them up and divide them by two, which is what I'm going to do here. So again, the median, you take the, the numbers in the set, you order them from smallest to largest, and if it's an odd number of numbers that you're given to work with, you just simply pick out the middle number. If you've got an even number of numbers, you've got to take the two numbers in the center, add them up, and divide by two. And if you're saying, why do you keep repeating yourself so many times? It's just simply because I've done this for quite a while now, and I know that it's easy to think you know something and remember something when you're practicing. And then when you've got the stress that test taking situation kicking in there, sometimes people will forget things and uh, mean, medium, mode, and range questions are a good way to get points on your test after you've seen a few examples. So that's why I'm repeating myself over and over again, to hopefully help it stick in. And the correct answer here is 79.61. That is our median.